Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 123 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Ann Corson, and the topic of the show is hypercoagulation. Dr. Ann Corson grew up in southeastern Pennsylvania and obtained her MD degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia in 1982. Dr. Corson has residency training in internal medicine, neurology, and family medicine. She's been board certified in the practice of family medicine since 1993. In 2005, she began studying and practicing integrative medicine and was board certified in integrative holistic medicine in 2011. Dr. Corson became a member of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, or ILADS, in 2003 and studied with Dr. Joe Burriscano and Dr. Charles Ray Jones. Her practice in Chester County, Pennsylvania is devoted full-time to the treatment of patients suffering from chronic vector-borne diseases and environmental illnesses. She has a wealth of knowledge and experience in treating these kinds of conditions and is passionate about finding solutions for her patients. And now my interview with Dr. Anne Corson. You and I have talked about hypercoagulation over the years, and the information that you shared with me has been tremendously helpful in my own health recovery journey. You presented hypercoagulation to over 300 practitioners at the Forum for Integrative Medicine in March of this year, and I knew then that we had to share this on the podcast. And my hope in this conversation today and for those people listening is that they'll really ask their doctor about the potential role of hypercoagulation in their chronic condition, and that this conversation will also lead to more practitioners, really deepening their understanding of this important topic. So once again, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Corson. Thank you, Scott. It really is a lot of fun to be able to be here with you today and to share you know, what I have learned about this very important uh, clinical issue in our chronic renal patients. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of history about it. You know, I first learned about hypercoagulability in 2005 from lectures that were being given by Dr. Gary Klepper during educational conferences that were sponsored by Mike Sheehan of the Bioresource Incorporated Company out in California. And it was actually a conference in Denver that I went to in 2005. You know, Gary and his wife, Rain, are really incredibly brilliant practitioners who were teaching the principles of German biological medicine, uh, and traditional Chinese medicine, and naturopathic uh, methods using uh, the different types of spagyric homeopathics, new and modulating medicines and nutraceuticals, among other things that um, Mike Sheen was bringing into the United States. Um, and Gary had learned about the evaluation, diagnosis, and treatment of hypercritability from actually Dr. David Berg himself, who was the one that really brought this into the awareness of clinicians. And he learned in 2003 from Dr. Berg, and then Gary very rapidly incorporated this into his uh, treatments and shared this information in his lectures. So I, when I learned about it in 2005, immediately began applying his treatment recommendations to my patient population as I recognized that many of my patients demonstrated both on laboratory and physical evaluation varying degrees of hypercoagulation stress. And then later I was able to learn even more uh, from about hypercoagulability directly from Dr. Burke's lectures. He gave four lectures in 2011, and, and then again, he gave uh, other lectures in 2012 at two different conferences that were sponsored by Dennis Schoen of Research Nutritionals. And uh, Research Nutritionals does uh, still sell uh, links to the DVDs of both of those conferences on their website. So again, as soon as I learned about hypercognitability in 2005, it became very clear to me that nearly all my patients had some degree of hypercognitability and could benefit from treatment for it as we worked on the underlying infections and toxins that were stimulating the hypercognitability in the first place. And then over the years, I found that addressing it in my patients made their, the treatment of their underlying infections and toxins and their detoxification easier, and it shortened the time for them to regain health. 
So I, I really think that all practitioners should at least think about this incredibly common pathological state in all of their patients and investigate for it in those with suggested clinical findings. Because a great deal of the suffering that our patients endure can be reduced and the healing processes of their bodies augmented significantly if all practitioners understood this issue. I do feel based on my own personal journey that hypercoagulation is really one of the most overlooked issues in treating conditions like Lyme disease, like mold illness. So let's jump in with what is hypercoagulation and what happens in the body when the molecules that are encouraging blood clotting and blood thinning are imbalanced. In health, the body maintains this wonderful balance between making fibrin and breaking down fibrin. And when the tail scale is tipped in either direction and the body can't recover homeostasis as a result of some stressful event, say a genetic weakness, a physical trauma, an infection, toxin, then the patient may experience either excessive bleeding, as in hemophiliacs, or more commonly, varying degrees of hypercoagulability or stickiness and the tendency to clot and to make excessive soluble fiber. So... Again, the body maintains this incredibly delicate balance of proteins to either encourage or discourage blood clotting. And it's a very, very complex and redundant system, a lot of checks and balances. So if you think about it, after we've cut ourselves and have an injury, we must be immediately able to stop that bleeding by plugging the holes. And then we also have to be very uh, ready and able to thin the blood and contain that clot formation uh, just around that small hole in order to avoid, uh, you know, losing our, our blood, right, and, and pouring it out of our body through the, the rent in the vessel. So there's always this balance. So a hypercoagulable state results when there is too many factors, an abundance of molecules that are encouraging the formation of soluble fibrin and clotting over blood thinning. So it's called the coagulation cascade of the proteins that do this. And there are a whole series of enzymatic reactions that where the end product is the production of soluble fibrin molecules. Okay? So soluble fibrin can, it can be a monomer, a polymer, a profibril, but it's only with a burst of thrombin that you get when a blood vessel is opened somehow. Then those fibrin will link together to form cross-linked insoluble fibrin, or blood clot. So generally, in the absence of a tear in a blood vessel wall, there's not enough of a burst of thrombin to actually create a clot. So in the majority of hypercoagulable patients, they only make soluble fibrin, which is kind of making a sludge, which makes your blood more like molasses than water. So if the production of soluble fibrin outpaces the breaking down of it, or fibrinolysis, lysis is breaking down, the fibrin will accumulate on the endothelial linings as sort of a sludge-like layer, which then traps toxins, traps infections, and can trap things like thrombin, which is a biologically active molecule. So this sludge layer that you just referenced leads to trapping of infections and toxins. How is it similar to the concept of biofilm? Is the sludge and hypercoagulation different from a biofilm, or is there some overlap between these two concepts? Well, you could think of that sludge as it is laying up against the endothelial lining or the cell lining as a biofilm. Um, there are also biofilms out in tissues, which are nidices of toxins and infections that are growing out in tissue, and they can have fibrin incorporated into that biofilm. You know, or there are also free-floating biofilms in the bloodstream, and a lot of their um, matrix that they have are polysaccharide matrices, all kinds of proteolytic glycans, um, all kinds of, um, you do have fibrin with those. Um, and so you think of a biofilm as having also infectious agents, you know, in it, sort of like a, a shopping mall. And you have a few dominant stores, a few dominant organisms, and a whole lot of little other ones too. Um, but this, when you talk about this, the sludge of hypercoagulability, it, it, it is fibrin, but it's a lot of other things in it. So there is an overlap, but I, I wouldn't say call the, the biofilm floating around the bloodstream just sludge because that's really a more organized biofilm community like the ones that you see on a tri-lab smear. So in the context then of hypercoagulation, what happens in terms of 
oxygen delivery, nutrient delivery when we're hypercoagulated? Does hypercoagulation lead to some cellular starvation of sorts? And do treatment protocols work better when hypercoagulation is addressed? Meaning if we're taking herbs, we're taking nutrients and things like that in our protocol, do they work better when they're more able to freely move throughout the body? Oh, most certainly. Um, so there are a, a lot of consequences of being hypercoagulable and having excessive soluble fiber laid down in the body that you're not breaking down. Um, and um, if you think about the sludge layer of um, fibrin, if you just get one micron, which is 10 to the negative six meters of soluble fibrin along the lining of the endothelial cell in the inside of the blood vessel or capillary, it reduces the ability of oxygen to get through that a sludge layer into the cell of the endothelium by 500%. So one micron decreasing oxygen in the diffusion by 500% is a lot. But it is, you know, your tissues get very hypoxic. They, they, they have a lack of oxygen. You need oxygen, of course, you know, for oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria in, in order to, to generate ATP. You, know, you need the oxygen at the end, um, except the hydrogen to make water. So, um, you know, the congestion that it develops as a result of this inability to get oxygen out, then you also have the inability to get all kinds of nutrients out, all kinds of uh, transfer factors, hormones, and then you're not able to get uh, waste back into the vasculature. So you get intravascular congestion, you get extravascular congestion in the extracellular matrix space, and this results in organ and tissue compromise. So Nutrients, hormones, and tissue factors can't exit blood vessels, and metabolic wastes and toxins can't go from the tissues back into the lymphatics and in the vessels in order to be excreted. And then again, another problem that you have when you have too much uh, soluble fibrin among the blood vessel walls is that you lose the uh, rapidity with which you can either vasodilate or vasoconstrict. So this sludge kind of makes a rigid blood vessel wall. And so it's hard for you to adapt to external temperature changes. You know, a lot of these people are really heat intolerant because they can't dilate their blood vessels very well to release heat, right? Or they can't develop a sweat very well. Um, or they can't constrict their blood vessels when they stand up very well in order to keep them from dropping their blood pressure. And they get lightheaded and dizzy. So a lot of things happen with the ability of the um, autonomic nervous system to control blood vessel dilatation and constriction if there's too much soluble fiber. It really affects the body in a lot of ways, um, you know, including just blood pressure control. So, yeah, the treatment protocols work a whole lot better when hypercoagulability is being addressed, uh, dramatically better. Herxheimer's are a lot less. Herxheimer's are ameliorated, uh, and people can tolerate uh, higher treatments, you know, higher intensity antimicrobial treatment more rapidly, uh, sooner in their treatment. And so all of the herbs and nutrients that we use uh, to do this and the enzymes we use really, really, you know, work a lot better uh, when you've got free flow of fluid and you're not all jammed up with glue. So you mentioned a number of things that can happen when we're hypercoagulated, but let's dig a little bit more into some of the key symptoms. And when you're working with a patient, what kind of clues you in to begin exploring hypercoagulation as a priority? You mentioned that it's essentially an issue for all of your patients, but at, at what point do you say now is the time we really need to explore this? And then it sounds like essentially almost 100% of your patients that this has proven to be an issue for them. So talk to us about the key symptoms, what clues you in, and a little bit of about your clinical observations? Well, these are the people that complain of a lot of diffuse, just body pain. Um, they can also have trouble sitting still. Uh, they're fidgety. Uh, they complain that their limbs fall asleep easily when they cross their legs or they put their arm down on the table. They fall asleep a lot sooner than they used to. Uh, they're achy. They have sharp stabbing shooting pains that come and go. They have uh, neuropathies in the uh, hands and feet sometimes. They're very brain foggy. They get very irritable. They get sensory hypersensitivity. They get anxiety. They can't sleep. They're stiff when they wake up in the morning. They're stiff after being sedentary. Or they have nausea, especially in the morning. Sometimes they have painful teeth. And, and I, I sort of relate that to when people are hyperfragable from babesia, the painful teeth. I don't know if that's true, but that's an association I find. They can't exercise at all. Exercise crashes them. Um, 
they have mottled skin on exam, cold and clammy extremities. Um, when you look at their tongue, sometimes the edges are a little bit sc scalloppy. When you go to examine their abdomen, it's kind of doughy and diffusely tender, especially in the periumbilical region. They look like they just have sort of tissue congestion. They look like they would have edema, but they don't. You know, the tissues are just puffy. You don't see a, a nice delineation between the, the bones and the skin on the back of the hand. You know, the tissues are just sort of puffy-ish. Um, and they have often horrible capillary refill. Uh, sometimes the capillary refill can be so bad in, in the feet that feet look purple or when they're dependent. Um, and another thing that I look at is sort of that generalized modeling sort of the skin. You know, when you see that sort of, they almost look like a model, like what a, a young baby looks like when they first are born and their bodies are constricting because of the cold outside the womb. Um, it's that kind of a modeling that you see uh, superficially. Um, and then uh, often you'll see an exaggeration of uh, dermographia, uh, you know, sort of mast cell activation type things in these people. Um, and sometimes when you examine their abdomen, I always put the stethoscope down in the abdomen. When you lift it up, you see that it takes a while for that capillary refill to come back. And sometimes after the, the, the capillaries refill, you get sort of a red glare, right? You see a little red ring on the abdomen where you lift it off your stethoscope. And sometimes it's accentuated the second and third time when you listen to all four quadrants of the abdomen, you know, on the skin. And that can give you a hint that you've really got dysfunction, you know, in the small capillaries and you may have some mass cell activation. If you do an office pulse ox on people, the pulse ox just doesn't work in the people that are really hypercoagulable because you just can't get blood flow down in there. So you can't measure a pulse ox very well. Very interesting. Tell us then a little bit about the priority of hypercoagulation in evaluating and treating your patients. Is this something that you do in everyone right at the beginning or are there certain things that lead you to say, okay, now it's time for us to go down the hypercoagulation path? Well, uh, just about everybody I see gets put on some kind of an enzyme. So I'm thinking about it. You know, there's sort of a bell curve of severity of it. Um, and it's really only in the really severe ones that I will immediately, the first time I see them, do my whole blood workup, my whole blood panel workup. Um, if I can just treat clinically based upon symptoms and they improve and it doesn't take a whole lot of enzymes, um, then um, I, I don't always do the whole workup. Now, if there's a family history of blood clots, if there's a history of, you know, antiphospholipid syndrome, if there's a history of any kind of Raynaud's, if there's a history of frequent miscarriages, you know, blood clots, those kind of things, then I'll definitely do that right away on patients if there's a positive family history of something having to do with clotting abnormalities. Um, and then if they're really sick, uh, often I'll do it. Uh, you know, the people that come in that are, you know, have untreated tick-borne diseases, they are living in a moldy house, uh, they have a high EMF environment, they're eating regular food, so they're up to their eyeballs and toxins, they've got metal mercury amalgams in their mouth. And those people are all going to need an evaluation um, with the uh, lab testing. Is there any truth to the idea that when you're having blood drawn, that if it's difficult to get the blood drawn, or if it looks black, almost like motor oil rather than kind of bright red, is there any possibility that that can be an indication of hypercoagulation or hyperviscosity? Um, yeah, I asked my nurse about this. He does most of the blood drawing. I, I do it when, when it's a really difficult case. Um, what will happen is we use a 23-gauge butterfly with a you know, tube on it. So that's a very good test for us because if they're really hypercoagulable, the blood will clot and you won't be able to get it out. Uh, sometimes the blood will clot too rapidly in the tube. You know, when you draw blood, you invert it a couple of times, then you let it sit for 10 or 15 minutes, and then you spin it in the centrifuge if you're going to be separating it. Or if you're just keeping it in a blood tube, you just turn it upside down. It shouldn't clot, right, like, because you've got heparin in the tube um, to keep it from clotting you know, on, on a purple top or a green top. So if the blood clots too much, then yes, that, that's a good sign. Now, I don't see too much the really dark blood. What I see is when people have a babesia flare, they're bright red. They're like arterial red when from venous blood. Venous blood should have sort of a purpley hue to it. It shouldn't be red, red, like arterial blood. But that's what we see with, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you draw blood, that they, they clot in the tube, you know, they got real problems. 
You mentioned the familial um, potential that that may give you some clues that a patient may have hypercoagulation based on symptoms of others in their family. So talk to us a little about the genetic factors in hypercoagulation. What are some of the potential predispositions? And can someone without any predisposition genetically still become hypercoagulated when they have a chronic illness like Lyme disease or mold illness, for example? Uh, David Berg always taught us that about one in five people have some genetic SNP that tends to make them a little bit stickier than average under physiological stress. So they may be chugging along just fine in life and not have much of a problem until they get a significant stress. And that stress can be a chronic illness, a toxin, a surgery, an emotional trauma, a physical trauma. So it doesn't have to be just an infection or toxicity. Um, so that's 20% of the population, right? But people who are chronically ill, you know, tend to also have hypercoagulability. Um, so think about it this way. If we have about one in four people have biotoxin illness from mold, and about one in five have a genetic SNP that tend to make them too sticky when they're stressed, you know, look at all the chronic people we have. You know, almost all of our chronic people are going to be hypercoagulable to some extent, like 95% of chronic patients. The patients that don't get chronic, you know, what is it? Only about 25% of the people who get Lyme disease get really sick from it and stay chronic. Well, you know, the chronic people that we see or that I see are going to be the ones that have these problems. So that's why so many of our chronic population have hypercoagulability. Now, if you are a practitioner that you see relatively healthy walkie talkie people, um, then you may, it may not be as big of a problem for you, but it, your patients will still really benefit from you learning how to use enzymes properly. The kind of people I see, almost all of them are hypercoagulable because of these physiological stresses. And, and someone could be hypercoagulated in absence of that 20% that have yeah. the genetic predisposition, right? <laughs> if you line up all of the, you know, the hits against you, uh, you know, even if you have normal you know, genetics and you're not, you know, you, you don't have a genetic weakness of protein S or protein C, or you don't have elevated lipoprotein A or alpha 2 antiplasmin genetically, right? You could be completely fine. But if you've got a, a whole bunch of things like a mouthful of metal amalgams and you're living in a smart home and you have tick bites and you have mold in the basement, you know, you've got too many things that breaks the camel's back. And then that's too much stress. And even a person who doesn't have the genetic SNP can still have significant hypercoagulable stress, yes. So let's then talk a little bit about those triggers or precipitating events that can lead to hypercoagulation. Are there some in your mind that are more significant than others? You've mentioned Babesia, for example, or maybe heavy metals or mold. Um, you, you alluded to the fact that EMFs could potentially be a trigger as well. So what are some of the key triggers that you see and which ones are more predominant in your patient population? Well, to get right to the punchline, I think it's sort of neck and neck between Babesia and mold. I think some of the toughest people um, I see are the ones that have real chronic babesia delicanis um, and then have other factors. Uh, the other thing which is a really, really strong precipitating event is say if you're trying to detox um, uh, heavy metals like lead and mercury too fast, that can trigger an incredible hypercoagulation uh, you know, crisis. But Becoming a little hypercoagulable is kind of normal for a lot of things. It happens during the natural aging process. It happens during pregnancy. Pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. So when you've got a chronically ill pregnant patient, you've got to really take care of that during pregnancy in order to avoid the consequences such as a preeclampsia or all kinds of placental abnormalities or intrauterine growth retardation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and of the infectious agents, you know, the bees is right up there. I think Bartonella is very important too, especially in the small vasculature. Um, and that really manifests in the hands and feet. And it manifests a lot in the um, small blood vessels to the skin. Um, and then, you know, of course, cancer is a hyperprivate state of cancer. I don't see a lot of cancer in my patients though. So um, I don't have a lot of experience with cancer patients, to be quite frank with you, at least in my Lyme. Uh, practice. Um, again, the heavy metals are horrible. Um, vaccinations can sometimes create a lot of inflammation enough that precipitates somebody into a hypercoagulable state. 
So often if you're trying to buffer mandatory vaccinations, don't forget the enzymes uh, when you're treating them with whatever it is, the phospholipids and the vitamin A and, you know, so you have to use that. Um, and then I find some people get really, really sticky with the electromagnetic radiation pollution. Um, and then uh, the trichothecenes of the Stachybotrys and Melania and the trichoderma molds um, really create a lot of hypercritability. Some people, when they get a mold hit, you know, they just have to be just, you know, sucking down Baluch and kinase at the same time, um, you know, for hours in order to get back to equilibrium from a bad mold hit. Uh, trichothecenes are worse than the ocrotoxins or the aflatoxins or the gliotoxins, uh, I think, in my opinion. But those are the things that tend to be the key precipitating factors and events that lead to a hypocritical state. So we have these triggers, but then we also can have other factors that either increase it or exacerbate pre-existing hypercoagulation. So what are the things that potentially make an existing coagulopathy worse? Any type of infection, like if you had an acute infection on top, like you're a chronic Lyme patient and you get the flu, you know, you're going to have your hypercoagulability exacerbated. Any febrile illness, um, if you have trauma, physical trauma, uh, you get in a car accident, um, any kind of worsening of your gut dysbiosis, any kind of problems with dental infections, uh, any new toxic load from the vaccination. Um, if you have a Herxheimer reaction, you're in treatment for your chronic Lyme disease, you have a Herxheimer reaction, that cytokine flare will exacerbate hypervitability. Uh, getting a mold hit from a you know, horribly moldy store that you go into or a movie theater or, you know, friend's house will also exacerbate it. Um, and as you are detoxifying from things like molds and heavy metals, when you are pulling those out of people's bodies, that can also exacerbate hypercoagulability. So whenever my patients are having a Herxheimer reaction, one of the first things I do is I usually double their enzymes because you will get from the cytokine flare, you will have um, activation of the coagulation cascade, and that will increase the production of soluble fibrin, which will exacerbate your hypercoagulability. Uh, and then another big one, I think, is uh, the glyphosate-induced sulfate deficiency um, because of the deficiency of the heparin sulfate on the epithelial membrane. So if sulfate deficiency related to glyphosate, for example, is playing a role in hypercoagulation, then do we focus on detoxifying the glyphosate? Do we figure out ways to increase sulfate? How do you approach that piece of hypercoagulation? Okay. And is there a way to increase the available sulfate in the body? Yeah, um, it, it's very important that people uh, take control of their diet and stop putting glyphosate into their body as much as they can. Uh, it's very difficult because it's in our air, our soil, our water, it's everywhere. Uh, but it really, this is a lot of the work uh, Dr. Stephanie Seneth has done. Um, and then there's even work before that uh, I'll talk about in a second. Um, so glyphosate impairs the sulfite oxidase enzyme, which leads to sulfate deficiency. And then you need sulfated proteins in the gut to maintain your gut um, impermeability. So you get leaky gut when you have a deficiency of sulfated proteins. Also, the glyphosate impairs the gut bacterial sulfite reductase enzymes, which leads to a production of toxic hydrogen sulfide. I think we've all had patients that get really sick from any sulfate. You know, they can't take an Epsom salt bath because it makes them sick. Well, these are the people who have such horrible gut dysbiosis that they have an overgrowth of bacteria or the bacteria don't have the sulfite reductase enzyme functioning because of glyphosate poisoning. So what the, the gut bacteria, the dysbiotic bacteria do is they make toxic hydrogen sulfide gas and that's really toxic to the body. So one of the things when you're trying, you think you're getting sulfate to people and they say they don't tolerate it, you've got to fix their gut dysbiosis first. So how does sulfate deficiency lead to other chronic diseases? Well, it's really important because all of our cholesterol is carried around and really utilized as cholesterol sulfate. You wouldn't be able to, you know, take that molecule all over the blood unless it's sulfated, okay? So there was a, a really neat article um, that I can give you these three articles I'm going to talk about in PDFs. I have them and you can share them with the listeners. One from the Journal of Lipid Research in 2003 that really showed there was a review about cholesterol sulfate and why it was important in human physiology. And it's a regulatory molecule 
from membrane stabilization, especially along the endothelial border. It helps to regulate protein clotting factors, platelet adhesion, fibrinolysis, as well as perinatocyte differentiation. So in 2015, uh, uh, Senef wrote a article where she had a theory uh, that sulfate, cholesterol sulfate deficiency syndrome is really um, a, a etiological factor for atherosclerotic disease. Um, and she was explaining atherosclerotic disease as a cholesterol sulfate deficiency. And, and that was in the Theoretical Biological Medical Modeling Journal. Then she also wrote uh, one of the, uh, she had like six series she did with um, other writers about the effects of glyphosate on our whole metabolism. And she was postulating that glyphosate's disruption of our gut microbiome induces sulfate deficiency. And that can explain for things like the epidemic of gout we have and other associated chronic diseases in the industrialized world. Um, so you can see that it's very, very important, the sulfate. So how do we get, um, also vitamin D is transported around the body as vitamin D sulfate. Sulfate's required for proper functioning of immune system cells. And again, by creating a deficiency in the heparin sulfates on the endothelial cells, as well as the cholesterol sulfate in the membrane systems, it contributes to hypercritability. So how do you fix that? Well, you can take uh, Epsom salt baths. You can have some MSM. Also eating uh, cruciferous vegetables, fresh ginger, garlic, coriander, turmeric, all the, the, the nutrients that you know, have uh, sulfate in them that you can absorb in, in an organic, uh, you know, biological way. Yeah, so if, for people that are interested in, in more on this sulfate topic, one of my recent books that I really enjoyed is called The Devil in the Garlic by Dr. Greg Nye. Um, and he goes into all the detail on this whole sulfate and sulfur uh, topic, including some of Stephanie Seneff's work. So I highly recommend that book. Let's talk a little bit now about the detoxification. You mentioned that necessary attempts to detoxify the body can trigger the coagulation cascade. So given that we really need to detoxify to recover health, but that doing it too aggressively can be counterproductive and further trigger hypercoagulation, how do we detoxify the body but minimize the potential for this increase in hypercoagulation? Do we need to go slower? Do we need to, to focus more on the enzymes? How do we balance that? Well, that's really the art of practicing medicine because what you're doing is you are making sure that all of the exit pathways are open. You make sure that people are moving their bowels every day. They have sufficient binders on board to bind toxins that are dumped into their gut from their bile. You make sure that their kidneys are working. You've got good kidney regulation and drainage medicines. Your phase one and phase two liver detoxification pathways are chugging on all cylinders. You know, you've got, you know, whatever type of uh, drainage and regulation medicines for their lymphatic system, uh, you know, all the organ systems. So they're supported so that the drains are open. And you start slow because as you dissolve that excess soluble fibrin, in that glob of sludge and debris, you can have all kinds of what Larry, uh, Gary Klepper used to call hot potato toxins. You can have heavy metals that have been locked away and the, the body just sort of glues the fibrin up around it to get it out of the system, right? Uh, you can have mold toxins. You can have um, infectious agents. You can even have thrombin. Um, and uh, if you go too quickly, you can overcome the body's ability to get the toxins out, and then that can, in turn, stimulate more hypercoagulability. So you just have to go slow, take your time, and then push it to poco a poco, and make sure that you know, you're know you going to have a hard time treating anybody if they're still living in mold, if they're a mold patient. They've got to get out of mold. They've got to change their diet. If they're not going to you know, stop eating gluten. If they're not going to stop eating, you know, sugar, if they're not going to stop eating regular standard American diet, which is the sad diet, it really is sad diet. Um, and they're not going to make those lifestyle changes, you know, reduce some of the EMFs, then it's going to be very hard to help them. So it's relatively easy to, when somebody is doing what they need to do, uh, to then open up their excretory pathways, stimulate the detoxification, 
support them with whatever herbs and enzymes and everything you need to do that. And then you can really, you know, grind away at this uh, excess soluble fibrin and then deal with these skeletons that come out of the closet and all of a sudden, whoops, you know, your, your virus really flared because we just let it loose. Um, and so you have to be prepared. And when you know, people all of a sudden start to have a, a symptom, then they've got to know they need to contact you and deal with it. But it's not, it, it's not difficult. It's actually fun to, to do that as, as long as you are aware of the fact that it can happen. So we're talking about detoxification, potentially triggering hypercoagulation. We also have the potential for detoxification or for toxins moving in the body to trigger mast cell activation syndrome. And so is there a connection between the mast cell activation and the hypercoagulation, or is it independent in that the toxins are triggering each of them, but that the mast cell activation and hypercoagulation are not directly connected in some way? I myself am not aware of a, a direct uh, correlation where mast cells, you know, actually directly influence coagulation. They may. Uh, that's just my lack of knowledge. Um, but it's part of how each individual responds to inflammation. Some people's mast cells are turned on more than others, and once they get all turned on and all the heat's on, then they just it's just this you know positive feedback cycle that just keeps going. So. They're probably um, co-passengers on the bus who take turns driving the bus of the illness. Um, I'm not sure about direct relationships one way or the other. I just don't have that knowledge. But not everybody who's hypercoagulable will have mast cell problems. And not everybody who has mast cell problems are horribly hypercoagulable. You would you need to treat with enzymes in just about everybody. Um, but, you know, there are going to be varying degrees of hypercoagulability in mast cell uh, patients. But a large proportion of our patients have really turned on dysfunctional mast cells. And those manifestations are a whole nother talk. Right. Talk to us about the three systems that control coagulation and how do they fit into this whole conversation? Okay. Well, you've got fibrin formation, you've got fibrin degradation, and you have platelet activation. Okay. So uh, those are the, the three uh, main um, systems. So platelets really are the ones that help to um, plug holes in vasculature. They like clump around uh, areas of real high toxicity. Uh, you have infectious foci, white cell blood cells, call them to come in. Um, and platelets can either be acutely activated um, which often happens when a, a clot ruptures in, or a, a plaque ruptures, and you, then you get a heart attack when a, a platelet plug all of a sudden forms in, in, in a, you know, some sort of irritation of a plaque uh, in, a, in a, a coronary artery. Um, or you can have a low-level activation of platelet aggregation and adhesion, and secretion of the platelets make a whole lot of things, which then stimulate the coagulation cascade. So platelet behavior is one thing, uh, and we can talk about that. Then the next is the fibrin formation, um, and that really, it, it's turned on and you have activation of the coagulation, you get excessive soluble fibrin deposition or production. And then there's fibrin degradation, which is called fibrinolysis, and if you don't break down the fibrin enough, or hypofibrinolysis, then you tend to have too much soluble fibrin. And a lot of the genetic weaknesses are in the weakness in breaking down the fibrin. So a lot of the genetic tendencies are a hypofibrinolytic tendency. Let's talk then about some of the factors that impact platelet activation and aggregation. Platelets tend to aggregate and stick in response to trauma of the blood vessels. When the immune system activates them from either toxins or infections, the immune system is responding to. White blood cells produce pro-inflammatory cytokines, which then cause the platelets to aggregate. Um, activation of platelets can be a sign of viral infection. Uh, a lot of viruses cause an acute activation of platelets. And then junk food, having a sedentary lifestyle, that all contributes to platelets activation and aggregation. Um, and then again, the platelets give you the, you know, they make the clotting factors that then help you to produce more fibrin. 
So, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease really, you know, one of the inducers of that is low level activation platelets. So, um, you know, these are the things that, that, you know, are very common in our patient population. And you have to think about platelet aggregation. And when people have persistent, you know, poor capillary refill, persistent cold hands and feet, you know, ongoing modeling, a lot of pain, still a lot of fatigue, and they don't really improve with the enzymes, always think about the platelets and then deal with the platelets. So let's then talk about the formation and degradation or breakdown of fibrin. What are some of the factors involved in the formation side versus the degradation side of this really important balance? Thrombin formation drives the uh, production of um, fibrin. You have tissue factors, you've got plat the platelet factors we talked about. Uh, you have things like um, plasminogen activase inhibitor one, you have lipoprotein A, which is a, a molecule that drives it, uh, alpha-2 antiplasmin. Um, these are all things that help to drive the production of cyborfibrin. And it's a, a complex um, biochemical process that has you know, both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways, um, and uh, there's all these checks and balances in it. Um, and I would refer you to David Berg's lectures that he gave in 2011 to really understand that. So those are the factors that help to drive the production of cyborfibrin. The factors that help to break it down, the fibrinolysis side, are our own natural proteins. We have antithrombin, we have protein S and protein C. We have other heparans, the heparan sulfates on the, on the lining of the endothelial uh, membrane, and the glycosaminoglycan, the GAGs out in the extracellular matrix. And then we can actually, those are anticoagulants. Those help to block the production of the procoagulant, uh, you know, cascade of proteins that makes fibrin. And then the things in our own blood that actually break down fibrin, the fibrinolytic things are our plasmin. You know, we have TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. Because plasmin is the enzyme which breaks down the fibrin. And we measure the breakdown products of fibrin with the D-dimer. Um, we also have uh, lumbar kinase, navokinase, which are external to us. So there's this wonderful checks and balances. So what are some of the factors then that impact the creation or the formation of fibrin? And what are the consequences of excess amounts of fibrin? Some of it we've covered, but are there, are there other factors or consequences that we should know about? Uh, formation is really determined by the thrombin level and the rate of thrombin formation. So if you have something that's driving a lot of thrombin and you have evidence of that on your testing, then you've got to figure out what that is and lower that because you can keep giving people enzymes to the cows come home, but you're still going to be making it. You're still going to be making it if you're driving thrombin. So each step has is both activators and inhibitors. Um, and you want to support, you know, what's low. If you see that the protein S is incredibly low or the protein C is incredibly low, then you're going to need to have the enzyme support uh, to, to do that. And again, you know, fibrinogen, which is the precursor um, protein for the making of fibrin, fibrinogen is cleaved into to fibrin. Um, those levels can be raised uh, by increased production by the liver in any acute or chronic inflammatory disorder. Fibrinogen levels are increased in pregnancy, in cancer, in estrogen therapy. Um, and then you can have a procoagulate environment self-perpetuating posit positive feedback cycle as a result of infection along the endothelial cell lining, anything like that. So those are some of the major determiners that are important in, in our patient population. I know you have a very extensive panel of tests that practitioners can order to get a sense for whether or not hypercoagulation is an issue. We aren't going to be able to deep dive into that, but maybe you can talk to us about some of the key tests that you use to explore the potential for hypercoagulation. Which of these tests are your biggest guides? Unfortunately, it's important to do the whole panel. Um, but what I find most commonly um, is that when people are making a lot of thrombin, you'll see elevated TAT. T slash AT complexes, that's the thrombin antithrombin complexes. Since thrombin has such a short lifespan, we can't measure it in the blood, but we can measure its breakdown products. You can measure prothrombin fragment one and two, which is the one of the degradation products when thrombin is made, and you can measure thrombin antithrombin complexes. So those two 
tell you about whether you're making too much thrombin. And if that's the case, then you better get rid of the infection, get rid of the virus, get rid of the toxin, whatever is really causing the thrombin to be made. Um, then I always look at the antithrombin, protein S activity, protein C activity. Those three should be within about a 10 point range of each other. And if they're off, say, even if they're in the normal range of the laboratory, but they're not in a one to one to one ratio, then you know you've got a stress in the system. You could have everything completely within normal ranges, and you could have the protein S be, say, 70, and the protein C being 150, and the antithrombin being 110. You know that that person has chronic hyperprivable stress because the protein C, a protein S, I mean, is either being consumed and it's so low, or they have a genetic weakness uh, which is not allowing them to mount the response they need because the protein C is dramatically elevated in uh, comparison. So those are very important. The um, D-dimer can be up when your body is actively trying to break down soluble fibrin. So that's evidence that you've got too much and you're breaking it down, your D-dimer's up, right? Then if you've got high tats and high prothrombin fragment one and two and a high D-dimer, you know your body's working really hard. It's making too much thrombin, but man, it's trying to break down the fibrin. Now, if you have a high lipoprotein A, a high alpha-2 antiplasmin, those can be genetic set points. They can be high in inflammation, but they can also be high as a genetic set point, and they just stop your protein S, protein C, antithrombin cold, so that they are dramatically um, uh, responsible you know, for a, a lot of um, hyperprivable stress when they're elevated. Right. So those are some of the ones that, that you can look at. That's why it's important to see all of them. The activated protein C resistance is what you look at to see if there's a factor V Leiden mutation. That's not that common. I don't see that many of them. Uh, what I normally see is I normally see some sort of aberration of protein S, uh, some elevation of lipoprotein A, PI1, alpha 2 antiplasmin, you know, as the genetic ones. So where should people actually get these lab tests done then? Is there one panel that can be ordered or do they need to do it with a specific lab? Well, um, it's best to do lab core. And the reason is when David Berg developed all of his this testing, he had a lab called Hemex Labs. Hemex was bought by Esoterics, and then Esoterics was bought by LabCorp. So they have all of the protocols. Now, one thing that we can't get anymore, which I, I really is horrible, and I, they used to have a test, it was an ADP test, and another test, that used to tell us whether the platelets were activated. So we used to actually have a, a platelet activation test where you could see whether they were a problem or not. Now you have to sort of figure it out clinically um, because they don't do that anymore, and it's sad. Um, but LabCorp is the best place, and, and I really would recommend that people do all of them. You can always do them. Uh, part of the panel is also a fasting lipid panel and a lipoprotein A. Just because if the, the cholesterol and LDL are up, then you know you've got a lot of inflammation going and that can really help guide you. But you can always do it in two separate blood draws. It's not that whole lot of blood, but it's complicated for the lab. So I uh, urge people to make an appointment with the lab or present the lab slip to them ahead of time so that they can get all the tubes ready so when you go in to have it drawn, you're not sitting there for a long time waiting. And so for listeners, we will in the show notes for this episode, you'll be able to find that list of tests that you can share with your practitioner as well. So how do you determine how abnormal the tests need to be before you decide to treat it? And do you treat a single abnormality or do you need to see several different indications that point you in the same direction? You don't really need to have anything abnormal as long as the balance is off. Uh, you can have all of the tests within a normal range and still have somebody who's hyperprivable because our body has such an incredibly redundant, beautiful, God-given system that helps to protect us from clotting too much or not clotting enough. So it's the balance of the test that's important. And I treat the patient. I don't treat lab tests. So if the patient has symptoms and gets better with the enzyme treatments, then you've got your diagnosis. So even one abnormality is of significance. Even an imbalance is of significance. How often would you recommend retesting after someone's been put on a protocol that would help address hypercoagulation? 
it depends on what you're trying to follow. If somebody has a really high um, prothrombin fragment one and two or TATS complex, then probably every three to four months, I'd check those abnormals or if the D-dimer was high. But if there's just a little bit of a stress and the abnormal protein SC, a little bit of high lipoprotein, um, you know, I, I could wait anywhere from four to 10 months, depending upon their clinical situation. When it's not clear whether a abnormal result is a normal physiological adaptation to the hypercoagulation stress or whether it is a genetic SNP, normally I wait even longer. I can wait up to a year because I want to make sure that patient is stable, they're improved, they're detoxified, they're feeling better, um, and then you repeat it. And if they still have a really low protein S in compared to protein C and N thrombin, then you can say, well, listen, you most likely have a weak protein S production in your body, and you have to be aware that for the rest of your life, when you have a stressful situation of any kind of stress, then you should take extra fibrinolytic enzymes because of your protein S you know, weakness. So that's when I would check that. So it depends upon what you're following. You, you don't do it every single time, but you can do it, you know, in, in um, sequential several months at a time in order to follow what it is you're trying to treat. If your fibrinogen is up, you want to make sure that it's come down. So that would be three, four months. So if you really got dramatic abnormalities, maybe three to four months, check those abnormalities again. Um, and then if you're thinking about a genetic weakness, then you can wait longer. I always, though, when patients are feeling better, repeat tests that were abnormal to document that they've improved, always. And when you're doing the repeat testing, are they still on the enzymes that were supporting the hypercoagulation, or do you have them stop for a period of time to see if that, if that still is something that's necessary for them? I generally don't stop unless clinically I feel that they can. Um, usually people in my practice are uh, almost always on enzymes until they're ready to stop treatment completely. So if that's the time when we're testing it, it would just depend upon what they're taking. I don't um, withhold enzymes in order to do the blood testing. So let's jump then into treatment. So part of treating hypercoagulation is reducing the systemic inflammation. What are some of the strategies that you implement to help reduce systemic inflammation? Well, we've talked about some of that already. Uh, you know, you really need to uh, normalize uh, people's omega fats. And normally we're so overwhelmed with, you know, bad toxic omega-6 fats that um, you really need to load them up with pure omega-3s for a couple of years and you just give them high dose. I mean, I use three, four grams of omegas a day uh, with food, you know, two huge ones, you know, twice a day to get somewhere between three to four grams. And I always do that so that, and that's a wonderful treatment for platelet aggregation. So often I think I'm preempting a problem with platelets by the way I treat inflammation. Then, of course, you've got to optimize your liver detoxification pathways. You've got to fix your gut dysbiosis. That's probably one of the main things you got to do first. If someone's really got a bad gut, you're never going to fix their liver until you fix the gut. And then once you, you worked on the gut, you worked on the liver, they're getting good fats. Sometimes they need phospholipids, too. I use a lot of phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, combos of the phospholipids. Then you really need to, once the gut and liver are doing a little bit better, clean up the extracellular matrix. And that's also cleaning up the organs. That's when your drainage medicines, your lymphatic drainage, your kidney drainage, uh, you know, your, your, all of your organ systems need to be helped to be cleaned up. And then you really want to start getting at, um, you know, the infections that you have. Um, drinking good, clean water and being adequately hydrated is also very, very important. And I like to have people have a clean, good diet. Uh, you know, organic diet, if they eat meat, 100% grass-fed, um, they need to just be very careful about glyphosate intake. They need to have their multivitamin on board, their extra trace minerals, uh, all the essential minerals on board, enough antioxidants, and then appropriate physical exercise too. You know, even if you can do just a little bit, you've got to move your body. You know, motion is lotion. Um, trying to reduce stress, which can be very difficult when you've just discovered your whole house is no need. You've got to do something about it. Um, but also thinking about the electromagnetic radiation in the environment. So those are the things that I address when I'm trying to reduce overall systemic inflammation. And of course, I use all kinds of 
um, nutraceuticals and things to reduce inflammation and help the body as well as uh, those things above. I use a lot of uh, combination um, nutraceuticals and herbals to do that. Yeah, and I love the trace minerals too, because you were mentioning the sulfate deficiency. And my understanding is that products like Quinton uh, trace minerals actually can also be a source of sulfate for the body as well. So kind of... Yeah, all kinds of sources of sulfate that, that, that I use that are helpful. Yeah. So let's talk then about the balance of the omega-3 and 6 fats. Do you tend to feel that fish oils are appropriate? I know there's some people that feel that seed oils are better. Is there some balance between the two? And what are some of the healthy omega-6 fats that you recommend? Or do you recommend completely avoiding even the healthy omega-6 fats until the omega-3s have been replenished? Well, that was the way, you know, Gary Klepper taught us way back in, you know, 15 years ago was, you know, load them up with their omega-3s for a couple of years and then go to your combos. Um, so it really depends upon the patient and what they need, what their diet's been like, what their stresses have been. Um, but the clean omega fats, the six fats, um, if you want to use an oil, I, I really like the cleaner nut oil, like walnut or sesame, um, or use a combination 369 or 3679, uh, you know, that's pre-made. Um, so uh, the problem is a lot of these safflower, sunflower oils, these things that cottonseed oil, there's very, it's very, very hard to find clean ones. Um, even foods that have organic safflower, the safflower oil doesn't seem to be right. So I try to avoid that completely. Um, and uh, I'm not a big fan of olive oil, although some people swear by it. I guess it just depends upon, you know, your body and your physiology. Um, but I tend to, if, if they're not going to be taking an omega-6, I generally don't use them alone. I'll use them in a combination if I go to it. I generally start with the omega-3s and then I shift to something that's got a mixture. Uh, but if they really want to be able to cook with omega-6 fats and things like that, I'll go to the cleaner nut oils. You were probably one of the early voices that I learned about drainage remedies from and the importance of drainage remedies. I think it's also an area that probably is uh, underutilized in treating chronic conditions. And so we're talking about the extracellular matrix here as well. So why are drainage remedies so important for unburdening the body of toxins that can be creating inflammation, but also triggering this hypercoagulable state? Well, you know, think about it. Don't you want to be uh, playing around in a swimming pool that's clean? You don't want to go jumping and playing around in a swimming pool that's full of mud, right? So your extracellular matrix is the uh, communication highway. It, it is uh, it, so important for the communication of the whole body, every cell to every cell. Um, you know, it, it should be that one little disturbance in the matrix in one spot of the body is immediately communicated to the entire body. Uh, that's what an acupuncture point should do, right? So if you're all clogged up and your matrix doesn't have that fluidity to it and you don't have the exchange of all these important, you know, nutrients and communication molecules and tissue factors, then, you know, you've got to get rid of that gunk. And what does the body do when it's, when it's, um, it's, it's got a toxic load? Well, it'll first, well, it's got to get it out of the bloodstream. So it tries to put it out in the extracellular matrix and it'll dump it in there, Right. And if it's water soluble, it, it'll stay there and it'll be a little bit easier to move and get out of the body. If it's fat soluble, it'll put it in your fat tissues. So it's so important to get these toxic metals and these toxic things out of our extracellular matrix so our body works. Otherwise, it just won't. And then you have all of these abnormal things there that keep setting off um, you know, the fire alarms and setting off the immune system so that you create inflammation. I mean, it's sort of a no-brainer. You, know, you, you got to clean up you know all of the streets if you want your cars not to be clogged in traffic right and that's where some of the um, products like the products from picana like uh, apohepad and renelix and iteries and mundiper uh, can can be really fantastic so um, such an important piece to think about drainage let's move on to hydration you mentioned the importance of being hydrated many people with chronic illness we drink a lot we pee a lot but we still are cellularly dehydrated so beyond just consuming more um, filtered pure water are there some tricks for improving the body's ability to utilize that hydration at a cellular level 
Uh, there are homeopathic medicines that help with that, and energetics has one, so several companies do. But remember that in mold illness, you have an antidiuretic hormone problem, and you cannot concentrate well. So you're, you know, you're always drinking because your kidneys can't hold on to excess, you know, the water it needs to hold on to, and you're losing. And then when you have inflammation, you're losing a lot of minerals, you know, through your kidneys. Um, and so you can't uh, regulate your cellular hydration very well, uh, especially when you're in mold. And then when you have hyperpigability, you know, you get all this stuff stuck out in the tissues and you have sort of water in there, kind of like with the mud out in the tissues, but the cells themselves may not be getting, you know, clean water and you get that, uh, you know, the water layer is, is disrupted. Um, so there's a lot of buzz about um, hydrogen water and different types of hydrogen waters and some of the tablets that you add to water to create hydrogen water to make it much uh, more able to you know go intracellularly and hydrate yourself and i would just suggest for people just to um you know try a few of them and see if, if some of them work for you uh, some people talk about that one called um water a w-a-t-t-a-h-h -A -A -H or something that seems yep. to be good and research nutritionals has a, a hydrogen uh, H2 uh, tablet that seems to work for some people really well. So definitely, but sometimes you can drink and drink and drink and you can't hydrate yourself because you have biotoxin illness um, or you haven't worked on getting rid of some of the heavy metal toxicity or, you know, you haven't taken care of your extracellular sludge and your intervascular sludge, right? So um, you can do all these things all together, but the detoxification and the Hydration are all important to do, you know, simultaneously. And for listeners, the product from Energetics that Dr. Corson was referring to is called Rehydration. One of the things that I did not know about hypercoagulation uh, until I had heard you speak previously was the connection to insulin resistance. So that's also part of your approach to treating hypercoagulation, reducing insulin resistance. What's the connection and how do you approach the insulin resistant component of hypercoagulation? You know, insulin resistance is drives inflammation. Um, you eat a real high sugar load, and you have a spike of insulin, and that uh, releases a lot of cortisol. And then that stress also stimulates the coagulation cascade. So that's part of the stress. Like you, you're frightened, you got to run away from that saber tooth tiger. Well, if that saber tooth tiger nicks you as you're running away, you want to make sure you stop bleeding, right? So the coagulation cascade and the immune system is put on hyper alert, and then you get stickier. So that's the connection. Um, reducing insulin resistance is hugely the patient's responsibility. It's what they put in their mouth. Now, one thing I do is I talk to them about how they can change their diet, you know, and that's a whole other talk, a whole other podcast. Um, you know, and you know, lowering the you know the foods that have a high um, you know production of insulin as a, you know the high um, you know glucose load then um, you all have to use like a lot of cinnamon and cooking. That's a good easy way to do that. And there are all kinds of herbs, things that help with it and chromium and other, all kinds of things. You just have to look up, you know, what herbs and nutrients and trace minerals help insulin resistance. But it's really the patient's diet. And if they can you know, make the lifestyle changes, uh, the insulin resistance fades away. Let's talk now about how we decrease the activation of the platelets in conventional medicine. We hear about aspirin or pharmaceutical medications. I mean, is that a reasonable approach to this platelet aggregation or activation side of hypercoagulation, or are there other tools in integrative medicine that might be more appropriate? What allopathic medicine is, they usually give you 81 milligrams of aspirin a day, or they use something like Flavix or some other platelet inhibitors, and that's how they treat our coagulability. They don't even think about the soluble fibrin piece. There's no way, there's nothing they do except if you're using heparin intravenously, that can help uh, getting stopping the production of soluble fibrin and helping to degrade that when you're using, say, Lovenox or you're using intravenous heparin. But they only do that if somebody already has a blood clot. So they're not very proactive. Um, now, in integrative medicine, the way we decrease platelet activation is using high-dose omega-3s, and I use you know, a lot more than 1,500 milligrams daily, but that's the minimum you need. I like to use between 3 and 4 grams daily. Using vitamin E, 
Uh, you can use things like ginkgo, there are other herbs, anti-inflammatory herbs, antioxidant nutrients. Um, um, I like to use Donchen Supreme a lot. Donchen, it's like an herb, but I like the Supreme Nutrition Products uh, Donchen. Um, that really helps. Um, Natokinase in and of itself also affects platelets. You know, it doesn't just break down cytochrome fibrin. So uh, that's a favorite herb of mine. Of course, a lot of the antioxidant nutrients help as well. And then you've got to treat and uh, get rid of the underlying triggers. So if somebody's got an underlying viral infection, or underlying, you know, babesia infection, or underlying heavy metal toxicity or glyphosate toxicity, you've got to deal with that. Um, so uh, I prefer using that than the than to the aspirin because the aspirin, you know, blocks cycle oxygenase really up high in the whole uh, production of cytokines, you, and you get both good and bad cytokine production decrease. Remember, you've got always balance in the body. You get good cytokines, you got bad cytokines, and they're always in a balance. And aspirin blocks it really early in the formation of those um, all of those proteins. Um, so uh, I really don't like to use uh, nonsteroidals or aspirin. So let's jump into the Don Shen. So um, you mentioned Don Shen Supreme from Supreme Nutrition. Is that in the hypercoagulation realm? Is it primarily on the platelet side or is it also helping with the fibrin part of this discussion? Tell us a little about Don Shen and how you might incorporate that into a protocol. Um, well, I, I use it for a lot of different things. Um, I use Don Shen, uh, of course, for um, Bartonella. Um, and that's you know one of the main reasons that we use Don Shen Supreme in, in, in medicine is uh, you know to help with Bartonella. But it does an awful lot of things. It, it's an herb that's been used. You know, it's salvia, it's red sage, um, and it's been used in people who have heart disease. Um, and if people have had heart attacks, you can actually uh, work and, and protect the cardiovascular system by helping to vasodilate. It can inhibit the platelet aggregation. It can protect against the ischemia. Um, and so, you know, it, it does an awful lot of things. And that's why I love the herbs because they have so many different um, actions on the body. It can uh, help to increase dopamine levels. Uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, Don Shen has been used to treat people with hepatitis B liver disease. Um, and it's also broad spectrum antimicrobial um, and against bacteria and, and fungi as well. Um, so there's lots of different things that it does. Um, and I just like it. It does a lot of good things. It also helps to uh, work as an anti-cancer agent, anti agent, and also against um, HIV, which is a retrovirus. So I don't know whether it's also helping with a lot of the retrovirus problems that we're seeing in our patients. But I find it to be very helpful, um, you know, herb. It was used in myocardial infarction to treat ischemic stroke and hypertension. Um, and then, you know, to inhibit the platelet adhesion and people who are prone to hypercoagulation disorders. So uh, I, it's a fun one and I enjoy using it. So if we turn now to dissolving the excess soluble fibrin, how often do you find that the pharmaceutical options like heparin and Lovenox are really critical? How do you decide between the pharmaceuticals versus sticking with the natural enzymes? Okay. Um, I don't find that I need to use heparin or Lovenox a lot. Um, in the few situations where I've had to go to that, I think David Burke talks about its use a lot more than what I have needed to in my patient population, and it may just because of a lot of the other neat herbs that I'm using, um, like the Donchen. When I've had to use Lovenox or heparin uh, in my patients, for instance, uh, uh, one time I was detoxing lead out of a patient using um, intravenous EDTA, and man, that patient got so hypercritical and that needed to put on heparin. Um, I had a patient who was developing preeclampsia. She'd gotten pregnant sort of as an oops, and she wasn't well at all, and her babesia flared terribly in the third trimester, and she got really preeclamptic, and she needed to go on heparin. Uh, I had another pregnancy where I had to have the patient on um, Lovenox the entire pregnancy and then the anesthesiologist chained her over to heparin right before delivery because she'd had multiple, multiple misses and she'd had gone into eclampsy with her first and this was her second. So I've had it to use it in pregnant patient and sometimes detoxing heavy metals. Some of the really chronic mold people that aren't really out of mold, they claim they are, but they're so chronic that you know they're still in mold and they still have a lot of mold toxins in their body. Sometimes they're so sick that they've got to go to a Lovenox. 
but I, I honestly don't use it terribly much at all. Um, and the caveat when you're using Lovenox is to remember that you've got to check the CBC within the first couple of weeks of treatment because very rarely the low molecular rate heparin can drop platelets. It's more common with the regular IV heparin you get in the hospital to drop platelets uh, seriously, but you should check if you're putting people on Lovenox. So let's then talk about the enzymes, the proteolytic, the fibrinolytic enzymes, and how they're used in the treatment protocol. Are there specific brands that you clinically find most effective? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm always using enzymes, some kind of enzyme. So how do you pick which one you're going to use, how, why, when? Well, natokinase uh, and, uh, works really intravascularly. Uh, the uh, lumbrokinase, and I really think the only brand that works is the Canada RNA Blue, and that's the original one. It's the one with the patent. It's the Japanese company. Uh, the, the knockoff lumbrokinases just don't work. I'm sorry about that, but that's just the way it is. Uh, the only really, the natokinase that I find is the most efficacious is the soft gel cap uh, that Allergy Research Group makes in the 36 or 100 milligrams. The soft gel cap seems to uh, enable better absorption. And sometimes there's a natocerazyme. I think Designs for Health or a few other companies may have a combo natocerazyme. And that really helps the little kids when you have to open capsules. Um, but generally, I use just the gel caps of the natokinase from Allergy Research Group, either the 36 or the 100s, or just the Canada RNA brand of the Blue. Uh, if you're using other ones, you're just not going to get the same clinical efficacy. So, natokinase and Blue are discussed, or lumbarkinase is discussed in, in Allergy Research Group's Focus magazine. They put out a really nice one in 2003 about natokinase, and again in 2008, I think 2010 about Baluk. Natokinase really works well in terms of when people have a, a bad infection of the vasculature. They have a vasculitis. They have that distal, you know, um, numbness, tingling, uh, poor capillary refill. They have autoimmune disease in the vasculature, like antiphospholipid syndrome, anticardiolipin autoantibodies. When they're in mold, um, when you want to start, especially in children, or when you're uncertain of what to do and you think they're hypochromic, you can always start with natokinase. You're never going to hurt anybody with natokinase, okay? Now, the loop uh, really is reported to work both intra- and extravascularly. So that's very helpful when somebody has that sort of boggy extracellular matrix congestion look to them. Also, when you first put somebody on natokinase and they have a low dose and they have a bad initial Herxheimer reaction, then you really need to go in there with the loop before you slowly increase the amount of kinase. Because sometimes it indicates you've got a really bad genetic SNP right off the bat, or you've got a really horribly congested extracellular matrix, and you just can't even tolerate you know, any type of uh, breakdown of the sludge that you've already got. So if somebody has a bad initial perks to the natto, and you know that you went slow enough, uh, not to, you, know, you don't start somebody off with 200 milligrams of natto kinase three times a day, you know? You're starting in case you're going to start with either 36 milligrams twice a day or 100 milligrams twice a day. Um, and then if they have an initial bad hurts to just that low dose, then you add the loop one twice a day when they come back or when they call. Um, and then you keep them with that and you give them good drainage medicine. Now, you can also, when they have a bad hurts initially, the natokinase, if they do, um, then it usually means you don't have your drainage medicine, regulation medicines uh, you know, lined up properly. Uh, if you have everything lined up properly, then you're not going to have a bad dose. But also, if they do have a bad reaction, something, some bad, you know, hot potato toxin, I love the way Gary said that, um, comes out you don't expect. Sometimes, in addition to the booth, you need to add a proteolytic enzyme like a serapeptase um, or an interface or something like that or a marcosine. Um, sometimes even an interface with EDTA, like the Interface Plus from Claire Labs. Um, sometimes you just need the proteolytic enzyme rather than the blue. Um, and then that's, again, where you can add the donchen, which is the really helpful herb. Um, so that's where you sort of go about determining when to use things and when to add things. Um, when you're trying to break up a lot of biofilms, often you need to combine one or two different proteases that either have or don't have EDTA with uh, often a high-dose natokinase. Um, as well as other specialty biofilm busters. You know, Beyond Balance has their BFMP, BFM1. Um, Research Nutritionals has their BioDisrupt. There are a lot of really good biofilm busters 
um, that you can use when you're really getting down in there when you're you're in the meet, middle portion of a of a treatment course uh, and you're trying to really you know get down to the deep doo doo and get rid of these biofilm cleaning. Have you seen any? over thinning complications with these enzymes. So is it possible that there can be significant side effects when we start implementing hypercoagulation protocols with the natural interventions? I rarely see any significant bleeding problems. I have only rarely seen nosebleeds with natokinase. If you give too high a dose to some natokinase to somebody who doesn't need it, you'll often just say they, they got a nosebleed or two. It stops. You know, I've never had a serious bleeding problem. Never, ever, ever. Then sometimes if you've got bloop and somebody doesn't really need the bloop, they might get a little bit larger than normal bruise if they bang themselves. But I have, even with people who've been on enzymes and had to undergo emergency surgeries, I have never in, in 15 years had anybody have a bleeding diathesis from being on fibrinolytic enzyme. The only thing that bloop and natto do is they break down soluble fibrin. A help and natto does help a little bit again, you know, with the platelets and whatnot, but no one has ever had a bleeding out problem like they would with Coumadin or with these other, you know, um, things like Flavix and these other Zeralto and all these horrible ones that are being used currently in allopathic medicine. Let's talk about special considerations around treating hypercoagulation in children. What do we need to think about in the pediatric population from a hypercoagulation perspective? Well, with kids, again, you know, you just need to go low and, and slow. And you'll know you've done too much if they get nosebleeds um, or they fall down and get a big, huge bruise. Um, if children can't swallow the little uh, football shaped pills of the natokinase. Usually children will start with a 36 milligram dose of the algae research group soft gels. Um, if they can't swallow that, then if they have to ingest a powder, usually use something like the natocerazine powder. Um, you really need to double the dose because if it goes right into the stomach, you're going to lose about half the enzyme. So if you think they're going to need um, you know, 36 milligrams twice a day, then they would need double that dose of the powder. So, you know, now uh, Re Allergy Research Group does have a 50 milligram capsule of natokinase. So they would need more than one capsule if, if you're going to be, you know, giving them a 36 milligram gel cap. You know, it's a little more than a capsule of, of the 50 milligrams, you know, to give them because they'll lose half of it in the stomach. In children, the hypercoagulable symptoms are a little bit different than in adults. They often present with leg pain, especially at night, abdominal pain, they're irritable, they have sleep problems, they're oppositional, they have oppositional behaviors, they have, um, you know, they're just bouncing all over the wall, they can't sit still, um, and then the hypercoagulability really worsens any Bartonella or mold rages that they have, so they can have worse rages and worse anger and worse you know, tearful, ta worse temper tantrums, and of course then they get fatigued. Given the complexity in patient protocols and taking lots of different supplements, do you find that the enzymes need to be taken away from food and other supplements, or will they still convey adequate benefit if they're taken with food? Um, they really should be taken at least 30 minutes before you eat. Um, the Baluk, one time there was a study uh, that's quoted in one of the allergy research group focused newsletters that only 10% of the Baluk was absorbed through the gut lining. So you, know, you really need your balook. So it, you're going to waste it if you take the food. They're going to be better absorbed if they're taken on the stomach. Do you find that some patients that tend towards hypercoagulation maybe need to remain on enzymes indefinitely or be on them during stressful periods throughout their entire lifetime? Yes. Uh, some of the people that have significant uh, genetic abnormalities say they have a really high life of protein A. Uh, they may need to be on, you know, lumbarkinase food for the rest of their lives. Um, or they may just need, they have low protein S, they may just need to have enzymes during stressful periods. So that's part of your job as a, 
uh, as a treating practitioner to teach them that. How do we balance, let's say we start introducing the enzymes, we start breaking down fibrin, it potentially has some biofilm effects as well, releases toxins, releases infections, maybe triggers inflammation, maybe even triggering some additional coagulation. So when people get worse when the enzymes are introduced, then what direction do you take? Is it that they need more enzyme? Is it that they need less enzyme? It usually is that you don't have um, enough drainage and regulation medicines on board, you know, they, and you usually need to go up on the enzymes. Um, but I would get control over the symptoms before I would increase the enzymes. So that if you have started somebody on enzymes and they start to, to have Herxheimer, then you've got to um, make sure that you have enough um, anti-inflammatory uh, substances on board you have to have uh, enough drainage medicines so that their liver can detox. They've got to be pooping. They need to be on binders. They need to be on kidney drainage, lymphatic drainage. Uh, if it looks like one of their infections is flaring, then you've got to hit that with whatever you need to hit it with. Um, and then you can always use the immune modulating medicines, the isopathic medicines, the um, uh, tremendous fan of the San Pharma and Cintrion products. We can't get Cintrion anymore, and it's just an incredible heartbreak for me. I would love to find somebody who would want to bring that into this country and help us make them because those immune modulating medicines are just invaluable. And in hypercoagulation, the one made from Mucorvacemus or the Cysercine was just, just unbelievably helpful, and I'm just I'm heartbroken without it. So, you know, that's where you can use those things. You know, you chelate the metals, you know, make sure that you're, because if somebody has a significant Herxheimer, to starting fibrinolytic enzymes, you haven't done your job well enough. You're missing something. You've said that if you're treating mold without treating hypercoagulation, you're not treating mold properly. And you've also said that you've never met a patient with POTS that was not hypercoagulable and usually from mold. Tell us a little bit about those statements and what you mean by them. Well, mold and these the toxins from mold and the inflammation from the mold drives hypercoagulability just because anytime you have inflammation, the coagulation cascade is activated. So if you're not taking care of the hypercoagulation issue and, and thinking of that in your treatment protocol, you're, you're not treating the patient properly. You're not doing an adequate job for the patient. That's what I mean by that. And then, you know, so many of these patients come in and they've been diagnosed with POTS and they're on all this drugs for POTS. Well, vast majority of those patients are still in mold. And because of that, they're hypercritical, and that's usually not ever been dealt with. Beautiful. In light of our current world situation, can you talk to us about the role of hypercoagulation in COVID-19? And do you have any thoughts on what people should consider to minimize complications if they do acquire coronavirus? Well, as we've seen, a lot of the morbidity and mortality in this disease is because of microcoagulation, especially in the lung. So they have some sort of almost a, you know, a DIC-like thing. Um, and so what is this from? Uh, it's from the cytokine storm. Um, and why do they have a cytokine storm? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, these people get this coronavirus, but then what's really happening when they all of a sudden, a few days afterwards, go into the cytokine storm and then develop respiratory distress? You know, is it uh, some other thing going on? We don't know that. But... Everyone should be on the fibrinolytic enzymes if they're starting to get sick. As a prophylaxis, I was having people take high-dose marcozymes, which is a proteolytic enzyme combo, which is very well absorbed, which is a great medicine from Marco Pharma up in Oregon. It's a Nesman product. Um, as a prophylaxis, because that proteases, those proteases would actually help to deactivate the virus in the bloodstream, you know, before you even gets or in the mucous membranes and stuff before it even gets into the, the lung cells to the AC system. So I think that the people that actually get sick with COVID could benefit dramatically from high dose fibrinolytic enzymes, as well as the people that are hospitalized should really all be put on heparin. And I think that they found that they really helped people in the intensive care units by treating them, you know, with heparin. I don't know a lot about the experience, so I wish they would publish it uh, unless you know some published study, I know that they found there's hypercoagulation happening in COVID-19 patients, uh, but I think that they should be treated aggressively and actually use the enzymes as a preventative as well. 
the proteases and maybe low dose down kinases. For practitioners that want to learn more about hypercoagulation, what do you recommend that they explore? Do you do consultations with practitioners to help kind of guide them in their hypercoagulation learning process? What would you recommend? Um, well, first place they can start is they can look at the PDF of the PowerPoint that uh, I gave for the Form for Integrative Medicine, What's the Fuss About Fibrin, which you have on your website in the Corson Corner. Um, and then if they want to delve deeper into that, then I would suggest uh, they go to uh, Research Nutritionals products and uh, get the Role of Hypercoagulation Biofilms of Chronic uh, Illness Conference for DVD set, which is the 2011 and then also get the Decoding the Mystery of Chronic Illnesses uh, 5 DVD set, which was in 2012. Um, then they can look at the information on natokinase in the Allergy Research Group Focus magazine 2003, 2008, 2010. Um, and, uh, you know, then there are a lot of other practitioners, uh, you know, that talk about hyperregulation and Lyme disease that you can read about. Um, I can uh, consult with practitioners uh, to mentor them on specific cases, I can act, act as a um, consultant uh, for practitioners. Uh, if they want to do that formally, they set up appointments to do that. Um, and you know, then you know, I'm, I'm able to help them and, and teach them more. Beautiful. The last question I have is always the same for every guest. And that is, what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Oh, I think the most important thing is to do the following up exercises. <laughs> because those five meditative exercises, the four standing and the meditation exercises, are really one of the best ways to maintain your physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And uh, there's really not a lot else you need besides that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Beautiful. This has been such a great conversation. I hope that it will be informative and enlightening for patients and practitioners alike. Um, again, in my own healing journey, this was such a critical part of that process. And it really was Dr. Corson that, that brought this to my attention and really helped me to uh, understand the importance of exploring hypercoagulation. Just want to thank you so much for your generous time today, for sharing your wisdom. You are so passionate about helping other people. And I appreciate and honor you, Dr. Corson. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Scott, so much for having me. I greatly appreciate it. You take good care, okay? You too. Thank you. To learn more about today's guest, visit annfcorsonmd.com. That's annfcorsonmd.com. annfcorsonmd.com. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a positive rating or review as doing so will help the show reach a broader audience. To follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. And to be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. This and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.